Welcome one and all to Umami Manga. I am Petter and this is James. How is it going? And today we are talking about Asadora Volume 3. I feel like we, we have so many series going on right now. We can't <laughs> do these as frequently as I wish we could because there are a bunch of other things that we need to do also, <laughs> which I mean, I love doing all of this. So I'm not complaining at all. Yeah. Just, or I guess I am a little bit. <laughs> I wish I just wish there was more time. But anyway, we are back with Asadora this this week. And uh, it's volume three, and this was another great volume. I'll say, I guess I'll start off on a slightly negative note while I love this volume. I'm not saying anything other than that. I think it might be, in my opinion, the weakest out of the volumes so far in this series. Mm. That said, I still loved it, though. It has its merits, for sure. Absolutely. It does feel like it's setting up what's about to happen next. Mm. And it's hard to really live up to... Uh, what was established in the previous volume and you know the highs that were there but mm. I, I will say that there are some good character moments here um, for sure and some, and and like i said good setup so yeah I, like you said i still think it's a, it's a good volume but definitely not as good as the previous one right right and definitely ha- i think it has both of us very excited for volume four yeah it definitely ended on a good cliffhanger <laughs> oh yes <laughs> so actually before we get into the characters let's talk a little bit about the kaiju stuff specifically that we got from this volume and the sure. first thing is kind of how the volume opens up with um, this couple on the beach who see this tail or tentacle or whatever that limb is uh of the kaiju probably supposedly the same one that we saw in uh, the first or well, well, no, it was the second book, but yeah, in, in, during that event in in fifty nine, mm-hmm. uh, I I wondered if maybe those characters that that couple, if those characters specifically would become relevant because of them being featured in that scene. I was wondering if that was the case, or if maybe <laughs> uh, it was just shown as an example of, I guess, just more people are seeing stuff like this around Japan, perhaps, or. If we are supposed to take that as those two people being the ones who took the photo that uh, Jisoji has. Oh. If that's the connection to that. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I really don't know exactly the significance of that scene. But did you have any thoughts on that? I thought it was a a funny scene because it's one of those typical couple playing on the beach <laughs> yeah. scene. Um, and mm-hmm. the moment is ruined by it. The monster in the background. Yeah. Um, I didn't really think about what happened to them until we started talking, but there is something about the monster that seems to be carrying on into this volume by Asa herself, and it's that the monster takes people. Yeah, that definitely got more kind of reinforced in this volume. Mm-hmm. True. And I don't know. There's no indication that these guys got taken, but. I don't know. Mm, I, mean, I, I don't know how far the monster has to be before for them to take. I don't even know how that works, to be yeah. honest. But <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me still. But um, that that's a potential. You know, anybody mm. who sees the monster maybe has the potential of getting swiped. But um, true, true. I don't know. That picture theory is a good idea, though. Because uh, uh, right. someone's got to take the picture. Precisely. Somebody has got to. And I feel like so far, at least out of the examples that we have, I think they make the most sense to be to be the ones who take the photo, but I don't know. Although they don't have a camera. I guess they, yeah, maybe they don't. And if that's it's the case, they have then, smartphones. then, yeah, <laughs> then maybe it wasn't them after all. <laughs> hmm. But anyway, uh, on the very last page of this volume, we also got a <laughs> very, very interesting peek of the kaiju again. Yeah. This time, a gl- you're catching a glimpse of its eyes, supposedly. Yeah, supposedly. It also looks like that that's would that's where its ears would be. Right. But but then it's got those glowing <laughs> eye looking things. So mm-hmm. it's it's an interesting potential design yeah. that he's going for here. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it's still vague, can can it? Like we right. don't exactly know what all of these parts that we've seen are, like the tentacle or tail whatever. Yeah. It's still a bit unclear as to exactly what kind of a limb that is. <laughs> I I'm gonna I'm just gonna say that based on this shot here, it does look like a 
a tail more than a, a tentacle, yeah. if you will. No, that, that, that so. is true. Mm. But it's still so interesting. Like, what is hiding underneath the water surface there? <laughs> it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. Mm. It's fast. It, it, we know it has claws. If, if it's true. the same one that's been you know, making those marks uh, at, on the tree and then that big footprint. I mean, right. Yeah, this thing is supposedly bipedal and has giant claws so that's right yeah i mean i'm just so far i just i i think i can't not think of something godzilla-esque mm -hmm. like i feel like it like at least in my in my mind until i see it thoroughly like properly i'm going to imagine something kind of reminiscent of godzilla i think i just can't not <laughs> yeah it's kind of hard not to mm. Then let's get into the characters, starting with Asa Asada. First of all, I just love how, seeing how impressed she was with the Blue Impulse pilots. I thought that was a lot of fun to see, kind of her mm. kind of fangirling over other pilots like that. <laughs> uh, since obviously she aspires to become like them or better than them, you know, it, it's her yeah. dream to become a great pilot. So it, it was just fun to see kind of her reaction to all of that. Absolutely. I, I really like to see that moment for her. Mm. And it was, you know, it was also funny her contemplating doing the sky riding, but yeah. you know, Kasuka <laughs> kind of was like, "Don't get cocky." Exactly. I love their dynamic. <laughs> um, but I, I found it during that scene. Uh, Jisuchi brought up the idea of, um, or or the well, the the events, uh, some accidents that had happened where pilots had bailed out of their crafts allowing their plane mm -hmm. to crash into, well, killing multiple people. And kind of how during the Olympics, the Blue Impulse pilots won't be permitted to, to just bail out like that. They Instead, they have to make sure to steer the plane away from where there's people. And, um, you know, e even if that does result in their own deaths. And I think, um, well, it, it was it was interesting to learn about, first of all, just kind of how it may have been. Obviously, I don't know exactly how rooted this is in, in reality, but it's still, you know, it makes sense i suppose uh, especially for a big event like this to have rules like that for pilots who perform these potentially uh, dangerous stunts kind of um but it also got me wondering if this might become well if, if something like this is going to end up happening either at the olympics uh, opening ceremony or maybe at a different point in the manga where it might be less predictable perhaps mm. But yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, it just got me thinking, like, what if Asa ever finds herself in in the situation where she has to kind of risk her life to steer a plane away from a group of people or something like that? I don't know. I, I just it felt like it could be foreshadowing to something potentially. You know, I almost think that it'd be foreshadowing to how Kasaka ends up dying, uh, mm. because. I think right. the plan is that they, they're they both going to be in the plane yes. against the monster. So it could end up being a situation where Asa is able to escape, eject. Mm -hmm. Right. But in order to save, you know, the lives of people, Kasuka crashes into the sea or something like that. Right. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that exact scenario, but I definitely have been thinking that something bad may come to Kasuga. We'll talk about him in a bit, but... Yeah, yeah. But but yes, uh, that that is an outcome that I would probably ultimately enjoy for the sake of the story, but it would break my heart at the same time. <laughs> I know. <sighs> the plane, what would happen to... Oh, like, oh, of, course, <laughs> of course I'm worried about Kasuga, but, you know. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh asa still very much believes her family is alive and yeah, not just yeah. that taken by the monster exactly um yeah. <laughs> which I, I believe when we talked in our previous discussion you were unsure if that's what she was uh, yeah thinking about right, right yeah yeah because I, ha I hadn't interpreted her saying that as, as the monster actually literally having taken them i just thought like you know taken it taken her family from them as and just you know killed them or some other way, just separated them. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, for it supposedly for her to believe that it has taken them, like kidnapped them in some sense, uh, which was what you also uh, interpreted it as in the previous volume. Uh, it's interesting, and I 
Honestly, I, I'm it like, definitely a, is. part of me is like, where is he, he getting that from? Like, why does he believe in that specifically? It's kind <laughs> of <laughs> random. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it, it feels kind of foolhearted, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> why are, are just, just too hopeful there? I, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> interesting that she has that idea. Um, I will say, though, that when I listened back to our volume one discussion, we talked about uh, the doctor that, um, helped her mom deliver the baby mm. and how he had mentioned to us that people were disappearing. Yes. Uh, now at the time, I, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I said it was some sort of foreshadowing for, uh, Kasuka to come to the story like he did. And, oh yeah. Uh, I think, I think you mentioned something yeah. like that. But I, I think that now knowing what I, what we know now and how Asa is contemplating or, or is, more, well, more so than contemplating, she strongly believes the monster took her family. Mm -hmm. It almost, it almost seems to that to imply that maybe the monster is taking these people, and that's why there's these disappearances, and that that's what it was foreshadowing. Right. Um, still a bit of a stretch because you know why? Why was the monster taking people? I mean, we, we don't even know why he <laughs> took the family. You know, it's just it's not quite clear, but yeah. I could see that being something that Urasawa was trying to mm. uh, foreshadow. Definitely possible, I think, for sure. And during Asas and Kasuga's discussions throughout this volume with, uh, or well, at one point with uh, Jisoji, they, well, they're, they're told that Japan kind of can't act against the kaiju uh, without first knowing exactly what they're up against, basically. And so Asas and Kasuga's mission has become to gather that information that they need on the next time that it appears. Oh, it's not just that they can't interact with it because they don't know what it is. It's, I mean, and obviously he mentions like some that, you know, the U.S. thinks it could be, you know, communist stuff or whatever. Right. Um, I, I think it's more so that they can't activate the self-defense force unless it's in, well, self-defense. True. Right, right. Exactly. And I guess in order to act in self-defense, they need to know that it is a threat i guess they need they, they basically just need more information in general on this kaiju mm. but but yeah and also you know as jisoo is talking about how he wants to avoid seeming like or yeah he wants to avoid conflict and war and everything like that of course so it is risky i guess to act against it uh, with that in mind as well but if they do know what it, what it is and if they can convey to the world what it is eventually whenever they are able to figure all of that out then Maybe it'll be easier to to act on it or to to move against it, perhaps. Assuming it is a threat for real. I mean, oh, I mean, it 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 it's, it probably is based on what what they did what it did in in Nagoya. I don't know. It remains to be seen, I guess. Uh, back on Asa, do you got anything else? Yeah, she's just incredibly overconfident. <laughs> <laughs> she is <laughs> in her abilities. Um, but that that's just like one of her qualities. And to be fair, a lot of just protagonists in general um are just really confident in in themselves um not all of them but <laughs> I, I feel like that's a pretty common uh, characteristic mm. i guess some people have a little more humility but it's not like it's not like she's you know unbearable to be around at all it, oh she's, no she's she's a very good person she's just mm. very confident in what she can do yes <laughs> they brought up the love song the yeah. The Because I Love You song again. So, you know, further pushing the idea that maybe that song will have some sort of play in the story. I mean, not like a, a huge play in the story, but I'm hoping that she'll find out who the heck that artist is. Right. And I feel like there's need, at this point, there needs to be some level of significance to it as well. Like, yeah. not, not only that she gets closure in just <laughs> finding out what it is, I, I want something a little extra, you know? Maybe she soothes the beast with that song. <laughs> oh! <laughs> that, uh, I don't know, that's really funny. Like, that song especially. To, yeah, just to has a, a radio. You know. <laughs> Stella! No. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> so they put rocket launcher, or Costco puts rocket launcher on the plane. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess it's, it's, it's sad to think that a plane that was meant just for flying is now meant for fighting yeah. or or has that but I, I think maybe she was overacting just a little bit like you know 
Mm. I don't know. I I see what you mean. I I don't think it was an overreaction though. Like it it she could have reacted bigger to it, but she didn't. Kind of. It's her baby. Yeah, but you know, it's just a rocket launcher, and everyone gets a rocket launcher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it is, I mean, I understand putting it there, obviously. They're up against something that might be really dangerous, so they need a way to respond. Exactly, you know. Ideally, you wouldn't have to use it, of course, but it, mm. this is for her and everyone else's safety. Exactly. Mm. That's all I have. All right. Uh, then let's move on to Haruo Kazuga. He's alive. He's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he is all right. Nothing bad happened to him. Exactly. Because in the volume two, he kind of disappears, you know, and we were... Oh no! What's gonna happen to him? Where is yeah. he? Yeah, but then he just okay. kind of appeared in the first couple pages in this, in yeah. this volume, kind of <laughs> just just waiting for Asa. But um, he might not be Asa's legal guardian, but he definitely, you know, definitely does care for her as if though he Absolutely. was her father. And I just think that's so sweet to see. I mean, their their dynamic obviously was brilliant even from the first volume, but. I I don't know. It's fun to see more of it in this volume, especially seeing more of more of Asa at this age, and uh, and Haru, uh, yeah, and Haru with with her like that. It's very very sweet, wholesome. Yeah, I love. I I really do love how protective he is of her, mm. basically being the father figure for her. And it's, Absolutely, it's pretty great for sure. <laughs> uh, I I love how he acknowledges his troubled past and basically when the blue impulse fighters had started flying and everything mm. he said like well those are dark days for me it wouldn't have mattered anyway if you had come to me yeah but you know i like how he can acknowledge where he's come from and now that he, he's in a much better place precisely yeah yeah i really like that i, I also love the look that also gives him <laughs> yes <laughs> when he's like uh those are some dark days for me <laughs> the look she's like mm. <laughs> <laughs> you're yeah. welcome Yes, yes, I love that too. It it really shows kind of I mean they 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 have they have this uh, chemistry that yeah just really really shows both verbally and visually kind of it's it's mm -hmm. so cool. I love it so much. But when um I think it's during the scene when he uh when when after he had put on the the rocket launcher on the on the airplane he admits to having or to still having nightmares about the kaiju that they saw back in 59. Oh yeah. So mm -hmm. I I don't know, I thought that was interesting to learn that that actually made a really big impact on him. Like more so than one might have suspected perhaps by just like he he's yeah. he's kind of a hard man to read. He he's kind of stone-faced most of the time. Like he mm -hmm. he doesn't really give off that much emotion necessarily. But we obviously knowing him, we know that he definitely has a lot of emotions and 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 to learn about this, I, I thought was was interesting. Poor guy. Yeah, he also said he wants to take the blame for anything bad that happens, which yeah. to me is just some giant giant red death flag. You know, it's like, oh no, mm -hmm. oh no. Um, yes. Yeah. So I that that plus the whole plane uh, maneuver explanation just does have me worried about him. It, yeah, I don't know, maybe either in this arc or in the next or something like that. But yeah, yeah. man, like, OK, so I'm going to say I, I, I already back in volume one, I predicted Kasuga would die back then, which, <laughs> which gladly, happily. Oh, your prediction not. is still uh, ongoing. Your prediction is still ongoing. No, but no, actually, I was going to say no, because. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> this time I'm going to take the other approach. Uh, OK, and I'll say that. This is not going to result in his death. Uh -huh. However, it may result in something else bad. Like, he may be able to survive, but he may still get flack for something. Something that oh, maybe, maybe Asa is going to feel bad about it because maybe she blames herself for it. But he's going to obviously, as, as he agreed with uh, Jisoji about, or uh, as the favor... Uh, was oh. that, that Kazuga would take the blame for whatever bad would end up happening. Um, whatever that could be. Even So basically, even if he lives, he still could get, end up in a bad place. Maybe he'll get imprisoned mm -hmm. or so, like get like some kind of bad penalty or something like that for something that could happen. 
Um, yeah. But what this, what this uh, whole favorite thing kind of uh, reminded me of even more, or kind of what 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 got what got me thinking of even more, was that it really is making sure that Asa remains this nameless girl, uh, or mm-hmm. or a nobody, as, as Keiichi would would put it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's it's. Um, I, th- I I thought that that was a funny way or an interesting way that the story just kind of keeps up that side of of Asa's character, I guess. Yeah, you know, I kind of had a light bulb moment when you were talking about that. Oh. Um. So I'm a little less convinced that Kasuga is going to die mm-hmm. because it it would make more sense if, let's say, they have a bad interaction with the monster mm. and they're crashing they're they're but they're about to crash and unfortunately they can't land the plane in a safe spot so the plane ends up crashing in a, a civilian area a populated area oh. um and kills some people um that would be really bad if if it was the blame was put on asa and so if Kasuga takes all the blame for that, mm-hmm. and I, I don't know that that could be something that lands him in jail or takes his pilot license away or, or some, something sure. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's basically something along those lines, as an example, at least that that I'm sort of thinking could happen. Okay, cool. Watch him die now, just because I didn't predict that. <laughs> 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 no, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there there has to be that blame factor where he takes the blame for it, and I guess you can't. A, a dead man can still take the blame for it, can be blamed for something. True. So it's true. not completely out the window, mm. but um, it would be easier if he was still alive. So. Yeah, yeah, it would be more difficult, I think, or like it would be more interesting, I think, for the story. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, yeah, a little bit nervous for what's to come in the next volume. Indeed. <laughs> uh, but do you got anything else on Kasuga? No. Then let's talk about Shota Hayata. Let's go! Okay, yeah. you know, <laughs> we only ever get like one or two chapters of this guy each volume. But I really like him. I, nice, I think yeah. he's pretty endearing of a character, you he know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's someone that you can relate to and just really empathize with because he has his his goals his dreams but at the same time he is still a a a young teenager you know and Mm. he has other thoughts going through his mind but i I don't know i i just i just love his motivation his inspiration i just think he's a great character and i want to see (laughs) more of him and mm. see him and Asa interact. It's been a long time. Yeah, it has. It's been too long. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, maybe next volume. Although I, I'm not gonna keep my hopes too high for that. Um, next volume specifically, yeah. I'll get to predictions later as to why I guess. But yeah, okay. We'll we'll just have to see. Um, but he lives in Tokyo now, and um, during the the part of this book that we that we got with him, I. I started wondering if maybe he's suffering from undiagnosed asthma or something like that, uh, like oh. without knowing without knowing that he's got it or like because he after having run for a bit uh, like early on in that chapter he stopped and he was wheezing like he was wheezing a lot, uh, which could point toward that. Uh, and as we have kind of started to realize, I think especially with this book, is that he while he you know running is his passion. He's really not that great at it. Oh, wait, you don't think so? At least the example we got in this book, he was barely able to outrun a beginner. Well, he says I'm blowing past him, so Yeah, but he was all he but he also took note that that guy was really fast. Mm. I don't know. He he seemed to be struggling a bit. Surely he was carrying uh the the extra uh well the 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 newspapers, but still, I don't know. I I feel like he's not that good at running as or not as I mean, obviously not as good as he wishes to be because he didn't make the cut for the Olympics but mm-hmm. I don't know I don't think he is very good at running. Okay, you know I <laughs> I see what you're saying, but I still think he he's like 
capable at running, but I don't know if he's going to be as fast as Olympic runners, though. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I yeah. feel like mm. to the average Joe, he's probably a pretty good speed, but to Olympian, he's just not quite there. That's right. that's what I think. Fair. I mean, th- th- that is fair. I-, I could also see, I guess, if if it's true that he has asthma without knowing about it, obviously that's that de- definitely doesn't need to be the case, but if it is, then I guess once he learns about that and once he's diagnosed with it and gets medication for it, like inhalers and stuff like that, that that can help help with that, then maybe maybe then he can actually get become fast. Or at least from my point of view, maybe not not thinking that he is particularly fast at the moment, maybe he can become much faster with asthma medication, hmm. potentially. But we learned that his handwriting is so bad that he hasn't been able to write to Asa. That was the reason why he hadn't written. <laughs> I did not see that one coming. <laughs> Neither did I. That was... And I'm glad it was a wholesome kind of just a, a funny thing like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, instead of him being all brooding or upset. You know, mm-hmm. his, I, I think his attitude is still really good. It um, is, yeah, yeah. And you know what is another thing that I was surprised about? How supportive his family was for him. Um, granted, they're still pushing him to be a runner and they're yeah. putting high expectations on him. But they're mm-hmm. also saying, like, don't worry about not making the, the, the Tokyo Olympics. It's okay. You, could, you can get in the next Olympics. Like, yeah. I feel like they would have really made him feel bad about it and still would bring it up. Like, you failed that, but don't fail us this next time. That kind of mentality but, but, they, yeah, but they didn't go yeah. about that they they encouraged him <laughs> so that was surprising for me um I, yeah i don't know what's going to happen when he fails again and again um, right yeah because honestly yeah. i'd be so i i mean while I, I i'm not quite on the same page of you as thinking he's not very fast mm. i don't think he's going to get into the olympics um it would be it would be cool i think to see him but i i just don't think that's mm. where his story is going right um, yeah mm. and so it, it yeah, I wonder how his family will take that, but they all want to move to Tokyo and yes. live as a family. So <laughs> I guess I guess we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like something that kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit about the letter from them to mm-hmm. to Shota was how basically the first thing they said. I think it was his father who opened up the letter. The first thing was just, "Dear Shota, how's the running going?" Or something, something like that. Like he immediately just about the running. <laughs> Which, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Like, because I feel like that's a little bit manipulative in some way. Is like, I don't know. At low key, at least. I don't know. Um, yeah, I could see that. But I, I you know, and while well, I, do, I do agree with you, I, I still think that Shota has kind of taken that dream as his own. Um, that's fair. That's fair. I think part of that has to do not with his family, although I'm sure he loves his family, but it's because of Asa and that he knows of kind of her accomplishments and wants to live up to that in a way, I feel like. And Mm. and running for him is how he's going to do that. I don't think I don't think he'll succeed, unfortunately, (laughs) but or or at least Olympic wise. Right, right. We'll see. We will, yeah, we will see. <laughs> hmm, hmm. But, but you know, I, I'm gonna tell you, I don't think, I don't think that's gonna matter to Asa, one way or oh, another. For sure not. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, she, she will just be happy to see him again. Whenever they end up seeing each other again. <laughs> <laughs> but anything else on Shota? Just going back to the the first volume where there was that one time where it said Shotaro. But we've right. never seen that again. And I and I was pretty adamant. It's like, I don't think I, I think that's a mistake. And we still haven't seen that since. So mm. I, I, I feel I think it's fairly certain his name is Shota. His nickname is Sho. I'm not as convinced. It, especially since the letter addressed to him was not Shotaro, it was Shota. Yeah, but like the the thing is like back the one time when his dad did refer to him as Shotaro, it was like this very kind of uh it, w- it wasn't a moment when it seemed like he was trying to sound a little bit extra proper kind of because they were talking about how he was being blessed by the gods and stuff like that. So I I feel like in a le- in a regular letter you might not necessarily be as proper in how you refer to your son. But when it 
But the address, you're going to use someone's proper name. Okay, that's a fair point, actually. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, yeah, okay. You may, you may have gotten me over on your side there <laughs> with that one. I just... It's just it, it it just seems strange to me to not mm. in a letter use the proper name um and that that it's only used ever once in that one mm. instance right um fair fair actually yeah. <laughs> uh good point good point and I, I also think it's funny that he would have two nicknames yeah uh, yeah yeah also I mean, special can... i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's cute <laughs> true sure. I'll, I'll give her that <laughs> In her letter to Sho, she calls him a ray of hope. Yes. Aw. That, yeah, that, that was, that was aw. It really was. <laughs> I mean, you know. It was very sweet. That's sweet. <laughs> it's super, super sweet. It's kind, of, it's kind of unfair that we only have really one chapter, or like just a, a few pages of them interacting when they were younger. Like, right. what was it? <laughs> 13, 14, or, or something um, or younger than that. I can't remember. I think she was 12 and he was 13, I believe. That's it. That's it. 12 mm. and 13. Yeah. And, <laughs> but, but I don't know. I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it. I feel like these two are kind of made for each other in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, you know, it's just unfair that we haven't had much <laughs> time with them together. But For sure. I mean, at the same time, I'm still open to them just being friends, you know? For sure. I'm not, absolutely. I'm not like... They, the, this has to be my OTP, but but it could be. It could be. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not opposed to that. <laughs> I have like my feet in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Great, but then if that's all for Shota, yeah. Then let's, I guess, talk about the other potential OTP. I don't know. Or, or maybe not. Well, okay. I don't know how to feel. Let's talk about Keiichi Nakaido. Uh, yeah, he, he has a very rude mouth. <laughs> uh first of all um yeah i think he gets a little bit better as time passes as, as time goes on though yeah yeah but uh definitely he he annoyed me in the first scene of this book <laughs> definitely <laughs> like <laughs> like how how dare i know the nerve i mean like i i, I guess i understand once even even twice, I guess. It, but but the third time, it's like, dude, you're yeah. doing this on purpose now, right? It like, definitely felt that way. <laughs> uh, uh, I I'm really curious what the the word was in Japanese because maybe depending on the word, it maybe makes more sense why he kept slipping. But fair. even then, it, it it just it just doesn't sound nice at all. Really not. Yeah. Or or, yeah. or even necessary. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> For sure yeah but i i thought it was funny where at least in that scene that first scene in, in this book he he seemed to be kind of an opposite to asa in the sense that well he is very pessimistic while she's very optimistic about the possibilities about there being this gigantic creature out there in the world mm -hmm. uh like he's he's a non-believer while she's a believer like just they they were opposites of each other really in how in their just thoughts and, and, and kind of approaches to, to that whole thing. So I thought that was interesting, but I don't know. I, I guess just in general, I, I guess ever since the, the first scene that we saw of him in the previous book, he is he is very pessimistic as a person. I think that was very, yeah. very clear, even in his, his first appearance. Um, so it's nice to know that even though he has that mentality, kind of, and even though he is uh, sick of his late mentor's research, he still saved it. And, um, I mean... Yeah, I don't know. I I think that's pretty pretty sweet, and definitely is going to prove useful if they can read the writing, um, <laughs> which got me thinking of something maybe kind of silly or definitely silly, but it could be funny. I, I I could see this maybe happening would be if maybe the way that they eventually are able to decipher the handwriting <laughs> is to get Shota to read it because he can <laughs> he, he writes just as bad. <laughs> That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that that way we can have shorts that, like and like I guess yeah. come into like the main story again, kind of. <laughs> That'd be interesting. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I really thought Professor Yodokawa would have more time in the story, but no, they right. just killed him off. Killed him <laughs> off uh, <laughs> during the time skip. But yeah, I uh, 
I like what we've seen of Keiichi after his rude beginning. Um, yeah. I think there's definitely a potential for a redemption. Absolutely. I'm not going to call it a redemption arc, but, uh, <laughs> you know, time for him to change and, and become a valuable asset. Yeah, I think he's always carried this skepticism with him, especially since it's not what his textbooks, what his professors probably had taught him. But I right. think he cared deeply for Yodokawa and, like, yeah. going to what you were saying, he kept all that and is trying to decipher what his writing is. So I, I think deep down he cares and I think there's part mm. of him, like the uh, imaginative and um, curious side that wants to believe, but it's his realistic side that he yeah. holds so strongly to that's holding him back. Precisely, yeah. I, th I think that's definitely accurate. Uh, but to your point about being potential, uh, I guess, love interest or, or some, some sort of <laughs> yeah. thing, um, you know, that was, so, that was a vibe I was getting as well. And it, it, it felt like that there were some teases in a way to something like that, especially from Keiji's, um, what, second cousin? Like, what, what's the relationship there? Like, I don't know, oh, so, relative. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. He was all kind of teasing him about, you know, finally being interested in women or, or something like that. Yeah. But my thing about it is, what's the age gap here? I don't think KH is going to be super old, but I don't know. Like, I can see it being 10 years apart, and she's still in high school. Right. I mean, for sure. If if he is that much older, then yeah, I don't want to ship it for sure. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not... Regardless, I'm not shipping it right now anyway. But... Yeah. I could also see him being younger than that, though. Um, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. he could... Like, because the, the jungle scene may have taken place only a few months ago, uh, as to where we are in the right now. Like, potentially. I guess. Like, possibly, you know. So it's... it's I don't know. It's possible, I think, that he is at least closer to her age. But, I, I don't know. He, because he, there were definitely scenes of parts, though, where he was kind of blushing a little bit uh, with her around. Uh, mm. and, how, and how he was like... Uh, I can't remember exactly, but when she explained her name and how she doesn't like her name, he, I think he made some kind of remark. Like, oh, it's, it's not bad. Right? I, th I think it's a good name or something like that. It was just like a little pass by comment. But he, he... And then he had PTSD, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Flashbacks. <gasps> awesome! <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I definitely feel that there are hints um, in a way. So that does get me worried because usually when you have hints like that, that means that the writer is trying to ease it in, in that direction. Um, but, mm. the, but then you also have Shota and it's like, <laughs> I, I guess she can have a, a love triangle in a way. Um, but if we're talking about in terms of where the story is going, I mean, you know, Keiichi would definitely be the more... <laughs> Uh, useful <laughs> partner to have, right? <laughs> well, not un like not unless he can't um, like decipher the notes. <laughs> oh, yeah, if Shota is able to read it, it's like okay, like, marry me. Like yeah. <laughs> she proposes. <laughs> it's like the Cinderella slipper. Like, can yes. anybody read this letter? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's so silly, but I love it. Yes, no, the so thing so is, so I, I could maybe, obviously not, not the proposal and all, and all that, but like <laughs> the, the, the fact that he might be able to read it, I do think that's a pretty decent possibility. I, I, yeah, I guess we'll see. Somewhat decent anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway. A anything else on Keiji? No. Then let's talk about Kinyo. Best mom! Yeah! <laughs> I... Yeah, yeah. I, I love how she has really, really embraced the mother role for Asa and her siblings. Mm -hmm. And and she really is their mother. Like, she isn't just... Well, well it seems like um, she has become their legal guardian. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think they used the word legal guardian, but they used the word guardian. And, well, so at the very least, she is a mother figure to them, and they live with her and everything like that. So mm -hmm. um, it's nice to know that for sure, because I don't think we knew that for sure, for sure, in the previous book. Yeah, I think it would just be inferred, but I think this is def right. definitely confirmation. I mean, yeah. I don't think even in the second book, you could really tell what kind of relationship they all had with her. But yeah, especially at the end of this volume, you see, okay, no, she has 
an important role in their lives as a mm -hmm. caregiver, you know. For like sure. She, she is their mother for the time being. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of sweet how she she well when she talks with us about it how she, uh, yeah, as like for the time being as you said, how once her mother comes back, she will give give us back to her. But it's like will she, will that ever happen like i don't know her mother ever come back <laughs> and she kind of word, words it funny like she says once you grow up and then i'll give you back or, or something like that like it, oh true that was something like that yeah yeah it was it was a uh, it was interesting like i didn't yeah. i didn't know exactly how to take it but but yeah I, either way yeah, she does give say give them back it um, Maybe it's kind of like uh, once you grow up and leave the house, then you can consider yourself Asada's. Um, oh, yeah. But for the time being, you're mine, Kinu, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But, but, but it is sweet. Like, she really loves Asa and, and, and all of those other siblings. Like, she... It's so, so sweet. And I love seeing how she lectured that, the, the other kids at, their, at the other house. <laughs> yeah. It was just so good. Oh, she's so good. And every time she makes like her like signature stern face expression, like mm -hmm. I love it so much. It never gets old to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that expression of hers. Uh, anything else on Kinyo? Nope, that's it. All right, then let's talk a bit about Yoneko Nakajima, which is supposedly her full name, or Yone as we knew her by, uh, and she, as we should probably be, be calling her generally. Girl. But uh, yeah. Yeah, she's still afraid of the conflict that might arise if she told Miyako about her being scouted alone. Mm -hmm. And and she's even keeping it from her parents as well. Uh, and I guess the, the part about her parents not knowing and her, or her not feeling like she wants to tell them about it got me thinking that maybe he or maybe her um, parents are especially strict or something like that. Uh, because... When she talked, when when they were talking on the phone, when Asa and Yone were talking on the phone about that, Asa didn't seem to like she she didn't seem very surprised when she learned that Yone hadn't told her parents about about it yet. So maybe maybe Asa is aware that Yone's parents are, I guess maybe more difficult than most other kids' parents or something like that. But yeah, she she's uh, probably gonna end up causing more trouble than she needed to by just. By by not by dragging this whole thing out, it's gonna. It, I feel like it's maybe gonna get messy. Yeah, I will say that the entertainment agency appointment, whatever, mm. is on October ninth. Precisely. And that is the same date that is shown at the end of the book mm. when the kaiju is supposedly rising up out of the water. Yep. So will that actually happen? Uh, will it happen simultaneously? Yeah. Meaning that she will go into, well, supposedly will go to the entertainment agency without Asa because Asa will be preoccupied. Mm. Don't know. Maybe maybe it goes really well, but she's ticked off at Asa for quote unquote d ditching her, <laughs> uh, and. You know she is. She just has a grudge against Asa for whatever reason, which Asa, would be really uh, that would be really upsetting. Very yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the best scenario would be that because Asa can't go, she ends up reaching out to um, Miyako, and it. Oh yeah. You know, they have a good talk or a good time or something. I don't know. I guess that could be good. Yeah. Though I doubt she would do that. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, you know, push come to shove maybe but yeah uh, fair yeah fair <laughs> yeah at this point hmm. she seems pretty convinced that the entertainment person does not want miyako around there although yeah i don't know I do don't do know. you think she's trying to avoid miyako getting like like kind of becoming uh, scouted as well because she thinks she might be overshadowed by her or something like that oh uh you know, I haven't thought about it that way. Either that, or she just wants the spotlight to herself. I thought she just didn't want Miyako to get hurt, you know, em emotionally. Like, Right, yeah. You know, what if she goes and they just say, who are you? What are you doing? Get out of here. 
kind of a mm. kind of a situation like that'd be kind of painful. But you're right. Yeah. It does kind of potentially lead into her wanting maybe wanting the spotlight to herself as well. Mm. Mm. Perhaps. Which would which would make her look worse in my eyes. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, seriously, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's an interesting little little side plot, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> this whole thing. I'm I'm kind of hoping that she just doesn't want to hurt Yako's feelings. Um, but yeah, I, maybe it's a little bit of both. Maybe there's <laughs> right. Else. Yeah, especially since in the previous volume, when Miyako was mentioning all these uh these uh, singer groups or idol groups or whatever, Yone and and like Yone like I guess she she tried to do it too, but she only ended up mentioning solo singers. So right. supposedly, Yone mostly listens to solo singers, and with that in mind, I think it makes sense for her, I guess, dream, would, would like to be to become a solo singer as well. Good point. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you're boring me to death, Peter. Oh my god. <laughs> I oh, guess no. you're right. I mean, you know. <laughs> I no. Yes. <laughs> I guess. Um. Yeah. No. I. I agree. Uh, mm. That's a good point. So, we'll see. I'm 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 hoping this next volume will bring some answers. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yep, yep. So, anything else on her? No, but I have something on Miyako. Uh, sure. Yeah, let's go for her. Uh, we understand that she spends her allowance on the getting the latest Beatles single. Yeah. And the one that they mentioned here is "And I Love Her." Uh, mm. I was not familiar with this one, so I went and listened to it, and I mm. thought it was okay. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely a beetle sound, but it's also it's like a minor key. It mm. feels like throughout, um, so it has a unique love song take to it, but it, it's certainly not one of the, their upbeat, catchy, frankly, uh, masterpiece songs that they've right. that they're kind of known for. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but you know, uh. Though that the sixties were definitely the the era of the Beatles for sure, and and like the the songs from the early sixties or like the first half of the sixties, like like well like yeah. where we are now, like I think uh-huh. the Beatles th- that era of the Beatles was far more. I guess I guess I could use the word cute, kind of, uh, <laughs> or like wholesome, kind of, because uh, uh-huh. I think well the Beatles in the late sixties was far more well psychedelic and. Um, yeah, yeah, and kind of push the envelope and less uh, less wholesome, I guess. <laughs> yeah, maybe more nihilistic. Uh, maybe I don't know. Right, I mean, yeah, in some maybe, sense. Maybe I'm going too far there, but <laughs> it's definitely some trippy stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I I love I love the fact that they they have those air like the, those completely like kind of honestly kind of contrasting styles, just mm-hmm. depending on which part of the sixties you're looking at for this same band. But anyway, anyway, I, I love the Beatles. Yeah, I, I love how they or Urasawa references just the the Beatles craze uh, mm. of the time okay. and how the the Japanese audience, <laughs> I they were basically re- replicating that in one of those famous uh, video clips of these girls going crazy for uh, the Beatles in a live concert. They're basically replicating that, but in a performance hall with recordings going on in full blast instead of actually having them live <laughs> yeah that, that, that's just so strange to me <laughs> i i wouldn't put it past japan to be honest i i bet you that happened for real <laughs> <laughs> honestly yeah i mean i can see it but still i think that's so strange <laughs> it is it is uh, to go crazy like that over just listening to it well i i guess it's easy easier to kind of get that way when there's a bunch of like-minded people around you and stuff right. like that. then maybe it's easier to kind of let loose I yeah. suppose. So, yeah, I guess it makes sense, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I do love seeing how Japan loved the Beatles, or, you know, I, I guess mm. I say, can't say all the Japan, but the, that generation was really loving the Beatles. And mm. I mean, I don't know, like you'll see classic rock bands even in, from America who will go to Tokyo and do shows and whatnot. And like Journey, they, they've been to Tokyo a few times. And it's just mm. cool to me to, to see music just being loved everywhere. Um, for sure. Well, should we move on to Minoru Jisoji? Yes, yes, yes. So he's very serious about getting the Olympics opening ceremony just right. Indeed. Especially because it is a symbol of peace. And he 
really seems to be all about peace and just kind of avoiding any kind of unnecessary confusion as to like you know not wanting to come off as a nation who wants war or like anything like that and i i i love i I love getting to understand his character better in this volume that or at least the way i see him right now is that he is a perfectly good guy just with i guess a little bit of an intimidating exterior his evil intentions of wanting to promote peace. Oh, so, <laughs> so, so we were, we were so like, you know, just like uh, wary of this guy in the very, yeah. I I like, oh man, what could he, what could be his evil intentions? Maybe he wants to use the monster for something. And he's like, yeah. bro, I just want the rings to look beautiful and perfect. <laughs> I want everyone just to be happy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it has to go perfect. <laughs> Every minute detail. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I I agree. Like he's he has these good intentions. Uh, passed aside for, for, I mean, we don't really know who how he was really in the military, but all his intentions are seem to be good right now. And and to be yeah. fair, I think his intentions for peace are entirely. Uh, selfish and patriotic in the way that um he wants japan seen in a good light he wants japan to move on like basically Mm. modernize um and and he i think he even says that in order to modernize they have to become a symbol of peace right um so yeah which in a way is was kind of i mean obviously (laughs) this is coming from urasawa who's from the future but it, it, it's <laughs> somewhat prof- prophetic because japan does eventually get this economic boon or, or boom mm. and uh you know that's definitely not something that would have happened if people thought japan was still hostile or something like that you know what absolutely I mean? yeah yeah so yeah so i guess taking that into account calling it i mean which i mean fair it's fair to call it a selfish reason kind of underlying but I, I do think it's ultimately, like, it's a totally fair, selfish reason. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. make him a bad person, at least no, based I mean, on what we know so far, you know? I mean, he's thinking about, he's thinking about his people, his country. And yeah. Well, yeah. I think some people would argue patriotism and, you know, favoring your country is probably a, an old-fashioned idea. But I still think there's something to say about the people in your community and caring about that. Mm. Absolutely. I, I think that's a great quality to have. And in this instance specifically, like Japan is legitimately in pretty bad shape, you know. Yeah. And and like yeah. reputation wise and everything. So wanting to in, in, increase that or improve that, uh, you know, that's perfectly right. perfectly understandable. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else on him? I just want to mention that the he talks about the the pilots crashing and killing civilians. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. they were all American pilots. So I just oh, want to yeah. say it. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned on this podcast before, I grew up on a military base, two military bases actually in Japan. So whenever like the American military is mentioned in these in these manga, I just kind of mm. like have a a twitch or something, you know. It's like ah, oh, that's that's my upbringing in a way. Um, yeah. <laughs> really quick story that that I feel is revel- uh, relevant. When I was in high school in Tokyo, a couple of kids from my school, I believe, went out to the the local town and they they had this wire or some sort of tight string that they ran across the road. So it, you know, basically it would grab onto any passing car or th- something and i believe okay. they ended up getting a someone on a on a motorbike and kind oh. of clotheslined them uh in the neck area and did some damage some pretty bad damage oh, um, shit. it was so stupid and understandably so the townspeople were enraged um mm. so of course those guys were deported never allowed in japan ever again rightfully so yeah and, and it's like that's the kind of stuff that really ruins relationship relationships between country. I mean, when you have things like that and like what was mentioned by Jisoji, you know, planes yeah. crashing and killing civilians and hurting people, it 
it's not a good image and it it yeah. doesn't build friendship relationship at all it's just sad and i i could go on a little longer about this but but i won't it's just you know it, it's just funny that this is brought up and i and i wonder i don't know i just wonder what people in in the urosawa version of japan <laughs> think about all that that's interesting yeah anyway so next i want to actually talk a little bit about koshichi asada asa's youngest sibling uh the little boy who was born uh as we as we learn for sh- for a fact in this volume on the same day as asa's birthday uh 5 years ago uh because we we weren't completely sure if he was born the day before or the or, or around the same day but turns out it was on the same day and apparently he actually remembers seeing that kaiju yeah man from wow. that day that's very interesting <laughs> On the day of his birth. Yeah. <laughs> he has a memory from his first day alive. <laughs> I saw everything. <laughs> the womb. The plus... Anyway, sorry. Stop. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's very interesting. And it, it almost kind of hints at some sort of powers. Like, I mean, yes. It, it, it definitely feels supernatural in supernatural, some way. Supernatural, yeah. Right. Somehow. <laughs> And I wonder, I wonder if it actually is, or if it's just a weird occurrence. It easily could be a weird occurrence. But I also wonder, you know, Asa seems to have been in contact with the monster in some way. Or at least, like, had heard the monster, she felt like. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know, is there something about the Asa family? Or just these two siblings? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say. True. Could be something like that. <laughs> Mm, yeah, we need more. We need more. Yeah. Anything else on him or any other character? Yes. So, Akura. Yeah. I thought he was American based on the nose, but they've had not <laughs> made any indication that he's English or, or, you know, he can't speak Japanese. I mean, clearly he's speaking to them just fine. But I don't know. His yeah. face does not, like, scream Japanese man. It, yeah. Those are some very almost European features. Right, yeah, actually, when I saw him, I immediately got monster vibes because monster uh, is another manga, obviously, by Urasawa. Um, I have seen the anime only, but they, obviously, the character models are inspired and based on the manga, of course, so it looks basically the same. And monster takes place in Germany, at least mostly. Oh. Um, so it is you know it's it's not about well most of the characters aren't japanese in huh. in monster and it, i i definitely got those vibes uh seeing his character design here so i don't know he looks yeah he looks like a caucasian and i i also got that feeling yeah not sure exactly where he's from but i also suspect he's not japanese un- unless he is but i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know <laughs> I, to be fair jisoji i didn't i wasn't sure if he was japanese at first either but you know i mean mm. with a name like jisoji it's like okay Right. I mean, yeah, that makes I me. Mean, I don't think it's a very common name, but yeah, it's. it's yeah, but like th- this name, like I don't even know how to say this guy's name. Is it Akura or Akura? Like there's like a dash between the A and the K. Right. Like, why? like it's a strange thing. Like it seems almost like a code name or something. Right. Right. Yeah. So I guess with that in mind, it might maybe he has a different name that he like that that has his actual name. Mm-hmm. Maybe a Western name. Who knows. I, I could I could see that. Hmm. Uh, for the time being, he's just a a, a bodyguard, really. So right, um, there's no indication he'll have really much of a role, other than calling uh, Asa into the the car. You know, we gotta go. <laughs> Monsters here. Yeah, yeah. And Asa also makes this uh, kind of remark that yeah, like she knows that he's trying to keep a low profile, but he really he re- he's really standing out. Maybe that is because he is not. Japanese. Maybe that's why he stands out compared to the other Japanese people in Japan. Maybe. Well, I I guess we'll see how much he how much more of a role he will have. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Secretly, he's the love interest. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> that's why he's always nearby, twenty four seven. Oh no! You finally noticed my feelings, Baka. <laughs> oh no! Oh dear. Uh- 
Uh, anyway, uh, that's all I have. <laughs> Great. Yeah, me too. So, on to predictions then. And um, as as you pointed out, this manga or this book does end on October 9th, which is the same day as Yone's meeting at the agency and also the day before the Olympics opening. And mm. so with that in mind, my prediction for the next volume will be that Asa will join Yone and go to the agency. Oh, okay. And either during the the visit there or shortly after it, she's going to be summoned by Akura or Akura. That yeah, um, and and be, and yeah, because they got to go to um, yeah, have a look at that kaiju that appeared in the Sagami Bay at the end here because it was seen by those men on the boat in the morning of the 9th. And I, I imagine it's going to take some time, maybe, for that to reach uh, mm. to reach uh, Jisoji and then Akira and then Asa. Um, so maybe she will at least have time to either go to the agency with Yone or maybe even finish off that, that uh, visit. Well, I, I guess, I guess it, yeah. I'm, I'm predicting that it'll be either uh, interrupted during the visit or, or immediately after. But I, anyway, I think they will go there and then she will go, yeah, or fly over to, to, the, to the bay to take a look at that thing together with Kazuga. It's my immediate prediction here. Praying that entertainment agency is not sketchy. Please don't be sketchy. Please yeah. Don't be sketchy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so actually what I wrote down was that because it's the same day, it wasn't going to happen. Mm. I mean, that, that's fair too. Yeah, but I did I did a little bit of uh, research um, to see if anything happened on October 9th. Oh, oh. Uh, do you want me to say or no? I mean, where, okay, well, what, what's your source for this? At Wikipedia. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, in that case, I don't mind. Go, go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So I didn't find anything that happened on October 9th in Japan that year. Mm -hmm. Um. The Tokyo Olympics start on October 10th, mm -hmm. but as far as I can tell, nothing drastic really happened on the 9th, but I could have easily missed something, um, uh -huh. you know, for all I know. However, that's based on what I've, what I've seen. So I'm guessing that my original prediction of her not being able to go to the entertainment agency because they have a monster attack is not accurate. Because as far as we know, Urasawa has been pretty consistent. Or, well, I should say consistent. Well, well yeah, I will say consistent. He's been historically consistent um, with what's happened in, in Japan's past and trying to give somewhat of an explanation for it. Mm. Um, even in this book, we have... Because those Olympic circle ring things were actually something that happened mm. at, at the opening day for the Olympics. Right. Among among some other things, so I I would think that if there was a monster attack in this book, there would have to be something equivalent in the real world at the time, and it doesn't mm. seem like there was. So yes, what I am predicting is that uh, they will have an encounter with the monster, but it will largely go unnoticed. Mm. Um, however, it will lead to something bad happening that. The blame gets put on Kasuga. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I I agree with that prediction also. Uh, and yeah, I, I imagine since... Or at least the way I imagine it's go, it going about, kind of, is that the information is going to eventually reach Asa. And by then, she will either be at the agency with Yone or having recently kind of finished off that thing. <laughs> Uh, the, yeah. at, at least that, that's how I'm going to predict it right now. And uh -huh. what, once that information do gets, uh, does get to her, she will fly to... Sagami Bay, and, and 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 see if they can still find the the kaiju there, and I believe they will, and to some extent at least, in some capacity, they'll interact with it, sort of, and and yeah, and then things will kind of happen there at the bay. So I yeah, and I guess mm -hmm. a lot of people might not necessarily be affected by something that happens in the bay. Yeah. Yeah. I still really want to know what that got. That guy who heard Asa's name, like, well, why, why, why? True. That? Like, that's still, mm, that's still a big mystery. I guess it's more of a want than a prediction, but it's like, <laughs> yeah. how does that make any sense? 
Um, hopefully that'll be explained eventually. For sure. I mean, definitely eventually. <laughs> it's gotta <laughs> eventually. Yeah. Um, also about whether or not the Olympics uh, will open in the next volume or the volume after that. I, I really could see either. Last time I thought I, I think I think I, I predicted or I I, I, I suspected that the um, Olympics would start already in volume three. Obviously it didn't. And now I'm even more kind of thinking that maybe it won't even start necessarily in the next book because with uh, well, assuming we'll have uh, we'll, we'll take some time at the at the agency with Yone, followed by supposedly or potentially a pretty major thing at Sagami Bay going going on, then maybe maybe all of the next volume is going to take place on October 9th. So we may mm. not we may not actually reach the Olympics opening until volume five, perhaps. You know, I told I totally can see that. Mm. I I also wonder like what's the pace of this volume gonna be like? Yeah. Uh or not this volume, um this arc. Ah, because yeah. The first two volumes, well, really one and a half volumes, were her at a younger age, and now we have one and a half volumes at her at what age? Sixteen, seventeen? I can't uh, remember. Seventeen. Seventeen. Mm. And I don't know. It's like, how long are we gonna be in this time period for her? Right. Uh, until the next one. Mm. So I, I could, I could see it being a whole another volume, but I also wonder if he's just he. He being Urasawa was gonna just go on to the next time period in a timely fashion, you know, and and not like prolong mm. this seventeen year old uh, Asa. I don't know. I I don't know. I I feel like it makes sense to uh, or I don't know. You can make a story about a seventeen year old more interesting than the story of a twelve year old. I believe. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think there's more potential kind of there. So I think. He could easily stay at this age for a long for uh, for more chapters or more volumes than he did um, at the twelve year age. I agree. Um, so with that, I, I I think he could stick around for a couple more volumes with this age. I I think. I agree. Mm. I guess I guess what I'll say is that I wouldn't be surprised if there was uh, at least at the very last chapter another time skip. Oh. Um, depending on what exactly goes down. That being said, we really haven't had the crisis happen yet. And I think mm. it's more likely that we would get a whole volume addressing it uh, versus just, you know, maybe maybe a half of one. Um, right. Mm. A whole mm. volume addressing it, and then the next volume, maybe there would be a time skip. But um, that's just that's just kind of what I'm thinking. I I am expecting mm. a time skip either in this next volume or the volume after that's my prediction i'm gonna say volume four or five we'll have a time skip that's exactly what i just said oh wait that, <laughs> wait 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 i wait okay i'm 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 i'm, I'm tired i meant five or six <laughs> <laughs> i you can't see me but I, I i literally picked up the volume looked at it as volume three i was like uh, you know what that's exactly that what i said. <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um Yeah, that's fair. Uh volume 5 or 6. I mean, we both agree that 5 is there's a possibility for it. Absolutely is. Mm, I I'd say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and and it's not like I want to, you know, speed things up or I'm I'm not saying that. I'm just no, like no. Mm. just thinking about what Urasawa was trying to do with mm. these natural disasters and giving them kind of a kaiju spin on them. Right. Um I could see him just going from beat to beat at a certain pace, but Nothing wrong with spending longer time at the seventeen-year-old mark. For sure, absolutely, totally fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm all out of predictions. I believe. What about you? I think I've kind of sprinkled my predictions throughout again. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, that, that's all I'm good. I'm kind of bad at that. <laughs> it's all uh, good. <laughs> but yeah, I think I'm good. Sweet. Well, and yeah, I guess again, I'll say sadly, this is maybe the weakest one so far out of, out of these. I believe I said at the end of our volume two discussion that my rating for this series as a whole was a nine, which is really crazy. Only two volumes into a manga for me, at mm -hmm. least. Uh, after this one, I think overall, 
I may rate it in an 8, which is still great, but it yeah. did kind of lower my overall view. My excitement, however, for the series has not dropped at all. I'm mm -hmm. so stoked to read Volume 4. I don't have it, uh, sadly, so I can't read it right oh, away. Really? Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah, uh, but, but yeah, whenever I do get my hands on it, I'm going to enjoy it, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read it tonight. <laughs> oh, lucky. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't remember what I gave it last time. Um, did I go from six to seven or seven to eight? I don't I don't remember. Ooh, I can't really remember either not right now. I'm just going to say seven just for the time being. But if I did mm. say eight before, forgive me. Um, <laughs> I don't think this volume would necessarily lower my score, though. That's good. So whatever score I had before, I'm still going to keep it. Um, because I do, I do think it is basically set up for what could be a very good volume four. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely fair. Yeah. So if you enjoy our content, you can follow us on Twitter at Umami Manga, and it would be lovely if you'd like to support us by rating our show on the podcast platforms and subscribing to our channel, Umami Manga, on YouTube. If you like this episode, please share it with anyone you think might enjoy it too. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time when we'll talk about Volume 4. Bye-bye! See you later! Cool, cool.